Good morning, friends, and welcome once again to our study in the book of Daniel. Today, our study is in Daniel chapter 11. I'd like to welcome those joining us across the country and around the world. It's exciting to get reports of folks who tune in every week to participate in our study and in our worship service here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church. We also want to welcome those who are here in person, our regular Sabbath school members and members of the Granite Bay Church and our visitors who are joining us. It's a delight to see you here again today. But before we get to our study, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father, once again, we are grateful for your word. We are grateful for prophecy, in particular, the book of Daniel that we have been studying. And Lord, we recognize the Bible is your book. And so we do ask for the Holy Spirit to come and just guide us in our discussion, in our study. Impress upon us what you would have us to know. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Today we are starting Daniel chapter 11. Chapter 11 is the longest chapter in the book of Daniel. There are only 12 chapters, so we're nearing the end of our study. And chapter 11 is divided up roughly into three sections. I just want to kind of give you the, the context before we get into the specifics. So starting in verse 1, Daniel chapter 11, verse 1, through to about verse 28, you cover the history of the Persians, the Greeks, and it also gets into a little bit of the Romans, or actually gets into pagan Rome. And then starting in verse 29 through to about verse 39, the focus is papal Rome, and then starting in verse 40 through to the end of the chapter, it talks about the time of the end. So it brings us right up to our time. Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 talks about the close of probation when Michael stands up. So three sections to our study in chapter 11. The first covers the history of Persia, the Greeks and the Romans, and then the papal power, and then it brings us up to our time, and then the close of probation. So a lot of important historical information we're going to be looking at today in our study. So we do have some notes, so if you'd like to follow along, you've got your notes with you. We're also going to put it on the screen. So we've got two parts to our study of chapter 11. We'll start with part one this morning and continue with the next part when we get to it. But let's start in verse 1. Daniel, chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. Now, you might be wondering, who is the I, even I? It's not talking about Daniel here, but it's talking about the angel Gabriel that appeared to Daniel in response to his prayer that we read about in Daniel chapter 10. The angel Gabriel appears and begins to explain certain things about what is to take place. Now, Darius the king, or Darius the king, uh, he was ruling at the time of chapter 1, as it states here in verse 1, but there were some interesting things happening in Jerusalem at the time. The prior king, Cyrus, had issued a decree that allowed the Jews to go back and start rebuilding the temple. But under the reign of Darius, there was opposition brought up against the Jews in the building of the temple, and false reports were being sent back to the king. While Daniel was aware of these false reports, he didn't go back to Jerusalem, he stayed in Babylon. Uh, he was aware of these false reports that were coming back to Darius the king. And so he began to pray, he began to fast, and you read about this in the first part of chapter 10. And in response to his prayers, first of all, Michael appears. Now Michael is the prophetic name of Jesus. He appears first to Daniel in response to his prayer. And then after that, you have Gabriel. And Gabriel comes to explain certain aspects of the prophecy. So now Gabriel in chapter 11 is going into great detail explaining different aspects of the prophecy as it relates to from Daniel's time all the way through to the second coming of Christ. So let's read the note there under Daniel chapter 11 verse 1. Here the angel Gabriel informs Daniel that King Darius had been honored by a visit from him to confirm and to strengthen him to continue his support of the Jews as the Samaritans were sending false reports about them to the king in an attempt to stop the rebuilding of the temple and the city. There were three important decrees that allowed the Jews to return and start rebuilding the temple and the city. The first was the decree by Cyrus in the year 536 BC. It primarily focused on the rebuilding of the temple. Now we actually have the decree recorded for us in Ezra. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but it is a very interesting uh, decree here. And let me read a few verses. Ezra chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, 
Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kings of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Who is among you of all of his people? May his God be with you. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judea, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God. This is Cyrus speaking. Which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of that place help him with silver and gold, with goods, livestock, beside the free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So that's the first decree by Cyrus in 536 BC, allowing the Jews to go back, primarily focused on the rebuilding of the temple. Now in chapter 11, we have the second decree, now by Darius, the next king, and that took place in 519 BC, and it was in essence a reaffirmation of the earlier decree because of the problems that arose. Remember the Samaritans tried to hinder the work of the building of the temple. And I'm just going to read a few verses here from Ezra chapter 6, beginning verse 7. It says, let the work of the house of God alone. This is Darius issuing a decree. Let the governors of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build the house of God on its site. Moreover, I issue a decree as to what you shall do for the elders of those of the Jews for the building of the house of God. Let the cost be paid at the king's expense from taxes on the region beyond the river. This is to be given immediately to these men so that the work is not hindered. So there you have a reaffirmation of the first decree, now by Darius saying, no, keep building, keep building the temple. Then you have the third decree, and this is a very interesting one. The third decree issued by Artaxerxes in the year 457 BC, that is an important date, not only allowed for the reestablishment of worship in Jerusalem, but also provided for the reconstruction of the Jewish state with powers of local government. This date, 457 BC, also marks the start of the 70-week prophecy, or the 490-year prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, which we have previously studied as well as the 2,300-day year prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. Now, we don't have time to go back into all of those details, but you remember with the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, we had the starting of the 70 weeks or the 490 years of probationary time that God had given to the Jewish people. That probationary time ended in 34 AD at the stoning of Stephen, when the gospel then, under the preaching of Saul, who became Paul, under the preaching of Paul, went out to the Gentile world. And of course, Jerusalem was destroyed sometime after that in 70 AD, marking the end of that probationary time period in 34 AD. But it also marked the beginning of the investigative judgment or the pre avent judgment. The 2,300 days in Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 begins in 457 BC and you go forward in time 2,300 years, 2,300 years and you end on the date 1844 when a special work of restoration or cleansing began. And we spoke about what that sanctuary is. We mentioned that it's the church, the truth of who God is. It's the work of cleansing of the heavenly record, the judgment in heaven. It is also a restoration of the truths that have been lost sight of during the long centuries, during papal supremacy. So we're living in that investigative judgment right now where the truths of God's word has been revealed. God is gonna do a special work of cleansing in his church in the hearts and lives of his people. We've got a question there, and then we'll have one right here. We'll get you set up. Yes. Oh, good morning, Pastor. We remember from Daniel 9 that in Daniel's 70th week, uh, there was a covenant with many for the seven, day, or seven years, and then in the middle of that time, the abomination of desolation desecrates the temple. If the 490 years ends with the stoning of Stephen, what was the covenant with many, and at what point was the abomination of desolation desecrating yes. the temple. Okay, good question. Well, just to clarify the exact wording there, it talks about a, um, a special arrangement or a covenant that God has with his people. That would be the Jews. The confirmation of that covenant would occur three and a half years into that last seven-year period, which occurred in 31 AD. So Jesus is baptized 27. It is the anointing of the most holy, according to Daniel chapter 9, that is Christ. He's anointed with the Holy Spirit, his baptism. Three and a half years into that, he confirms the covenant. How does he confirm the covenant? By dying on the cross. But that also brings an end to the Old Testament sacrificial system. The veil was rent in the temple from top to bottom. Then for another three and a half years, the apostles preached almost exclusively to the Jews. There were a few exceptions, but almost exclusively to the Jews until the stoning of Stephen 
in 34 AD. So that last seven-week time period of the 490 years begins in 27 AD and ends in 34. The abomination of desolation, which is to come to destroy the temple, is a reference to Rome and its destruction of Jerusalem, which occurred 40 years after in 70 AD. So it didn't fall within that last week. It didn't fall within the 490 years, but it was prophesied that a judgment would come upon Jerusalem, which of course it did. I saw a hand right here. If we could bring down a microphone right here, and while we get that set up, let me talk a little bit more about this third decree. So we're talking about this decree that went into effect in 457 BC. We actually have the wording of the decree right here in Ezra, Ezra chapter 7. And I'm just going to read a few verses here quickly. Starting in verse 12, it says, Artaxerxes, king of kings, verse 13, I issue a decree that all those people of Israel and of the priests and the Levites in my realm who volunteered to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. And whereas you are being sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire concerning Jude and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and whereas you are to carry the silver and the gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. And then the decree goes on. So we have three decrees, Cyrus, Darius, and then Artaxerxes. But Artaxerxes' decree not only allowed the rebuilding of the temple, which was pretty much done at the time, but finishing the walls surrounding Jerusalem and the establishment of their own uh, rulership within their area there in Jerusalem and Judea. All right, we've got another question. Yes. Jerusalem's literal 70 years of captivity. Are we saying that that ended in 457? Uh, the first, yes. Well, the decree actually started a little bit earlier than that. Cyrus was really the one that ended the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. But it was Artaxerxes that gave the starting point of the 490 years as well as the 2,300 years. So the ending of the 70 years and the beginning of the 490 years didn't occur at the exact same time. There was a period of time as you had Cyrus, Darius, and then Artaxerxes that issued that decree. So good question. All right, so those are the three decrees that we have, very important in moving forward, and that's what's referred to there in verse 1. Now, let's look at verse 2, Daniel chapter 11, verse 2. And now I will tell you the truth. Who is speaking here? This is uh, the angel. This is Gabriel. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Now, what we're going to be seeing in the next few verses is rather remarkable. This has actually led many skeptics of the Bible, at least at first, to discredit the book of Daniel, saying that it could not have been written by Daniel. It must have been written by some later scholar because it speaks about events that took place after Daniel's time. And they said, well, you know, they question the inspiration of the scriptures. And they say it's just a historical book. But the details are so accurate that they said it can't be Daniel that actually wrote the book of Daniel. It must have been somebody else. Well, this idea became pretty popular until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls date all the way back to around the time of Christ, about 100 years. Some of the oldest parts of the Dead Sea Scrolls, about 100 years before Christ. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is a clear reference to the book of Daniel. So the book of Daniel was written, as it said, by Daniel around... 500 years before Christ, and the events described were prophetic events that were seen uh, and revealed by inspiration to Daniel, by the angel. And so we're going to get into the exact details here. All right, looking at the note. The three kings in Persia refer to the three kings that followed Cyrus on the throne. Cambyses, Falsmerdus of Berdia, and Darius I. Xerxes is the fourth king after Cyrus, and as identified by the name Ajuerus in the book of Esther. Of him it is recorded that he was proud of the riches of his glory. Now notice what the verse said. It says, the fourth shall be far richer than them all. So that's referring to Xerxes or Ajuerus. And here we have the reference in the book of Esther, Esther chapter 1, verse 2. In those days when King Ajuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all of his officials and his servants, the powers of Persia, Media, the nobles, the princes of the provinces before him. Verse 4 says, 
when he showed them the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesties for many days, 180 days in all. So a feast that lasted 180 days. And of course, you remember the story how Esther was involved with that. The next part of the verse says, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Xerxes did stir up all against the realm of Greece by assembling a massive army of soldiers from India, Ethiopia, Arabia, Armenia. But despite his vast army, he was finally defeated at the Battle of Salamis, 480 BC. Xerxes was the last of the Persian kings to invade Greece. So Persia is beginning to wane and Greece is beginning to come onto the scene. Well, it was a very splendid king, Xerxes, or Azuerus, according to the book of Esther. These are some of the remains of the palace of Xerxes. This was the palace where Esther was the queen. It was a vast palace. Here is an architect's drawing or an artist's rendition based upon the foundations of the palace. It was a splendid palace. Esther walked on those grounds. Azuerus was the king, and the whole story of Mordecai played out, and Haman, that you read about in the book of Esther, played out here in the palace. Okay, verse 3. Then it goes on. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Next, the prophecy passes over six minor rulers to introduce a mighty king. Who is this mighty king? It is Alexander the Great. So we're moving now into the time of Greece or Greece power. Alexander ascended, the, ascended to power at the tender age of 20, following the assassination of his father, Philip of Macedon. With incredible swiftness, he united the Greek states and achieved numerous victories, and he did so quickly. In 331 BC, he embarked on a daring campaign with, almost, with a modest force, I should say, of 50 or 35,000 men. His military genius led to a string of triumphant victories. First, he conquered Granicus, followed by a decisive triumph at Isis the next year, and then Tyre the, the year after that. Pushing through Palestine, he claimed Gaza and entered Egypt, where he founded the city of Alexandria in 331 BC. In the same year, he defeated King Darius III at the Battle of Arbala. King Darius III was the Persian king. And after consolidating his control over his empire, he set out on two more years of relentless conquest. Within a few short years, he quickly became the acknowledged ruler of the then-known world. His dominion extended from Macedonia and Greece to the northwestern India and from Egypt to the Caspian Sea. It was the largest empire the world had yet known around the Mediterranean area. And here we have a map of Alexander's conquest. It's kind of interesting. You can see where it began. If you go to the top left, it's Macedon, a place called Pella. Uh, the first uh, battle and victory was Granicus, and then you can follow the red line down to Tyre, Isis, and then Tyre, and then down into Egypt. Founded Alexandria, and then if you come back up and you go over to Mesopotamia, there was this decisive battle in 331 in Arbala, and that was really the collapse of the Persian Empire. And after consolidating in Babylon, he set out on two years of conquest. It took him all the way to the borders of India, and finally, he came back to Babylon. And it was in Babylon, he made Babylon his capital, and that's where Alexander died. Okay, reading the note under verse 4. Despite Alexander's rapid ascent and unparalleled political power, his decline was just as swift. In 323 BC, he established Babylon as his capital, but in that same year, after a night of heavy drinking, he fell seriously ill and died at the young age of 32. So he was a genius military leader. He controlled armies and nations, but he couldn't control himself. He gave into drinking and he died, some think of maybe a fever that had been brought about as a result of his heavy drinking. All right, we have a, a hand up there. We'll get the microphone set up for you. Okay, but then the story goes on in verse 4. And when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up. Now the he there is Alexander the Great. When he has arisen... His kingdom, that's the kingdom of Greece, shall be broken up and divided towards the four winds of heaven. In other words, his kingdom will divide it up, be divided up into four. But not amongst his posterity, it won't be to his son, nor according to his dominion, they won't have their pow his power with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. So we're going to look at how this verse was fulfilled when you look at what happened to Alexander after he died. But we have a question. So right over there, yes. Yes, Pastor. I have a really a historical question. 
do, do we understand why Alexander stopped with Greece and not moved further west? Surely he would have known of the, the Carthaginians you know, in North Africa or the Etruscans in the boot of Italy or the Germanic tribes yes. in the north of the Rhine. Do we know what? Yes, uh, at least in, in the mind of the people living around that time, around the Mediterranean, Europe as we know it now was sort of barbaric lands. It wasn't even worth messing with. There were these various tribes. Uh, many of them were violent and to send forces up there, you didn't have the support, you didn't have the road structure. But to go east and to conquer through Mesopotamia, of course the Persians had already built roads in that area all the way down to the borders of India. If you go south through Palestine, there were roads established all the way down to Egypt. Egypt was sort of the capital country of the world at the time, second to the Grecian power coming up in Macedonia. Even Rome at the time was not really considered much of a prize. You don't find Rome coming up until later on in the, in the reign of Greece. So everything sort of north of Mas Macedonia or Greece wasn't really considered worth investing time and effort to try and conquer at this point. It did become valuable later on during the Roman Empire. Good question. Okay, so what happens after Alexander dies? If you look at the note here, after the death of Alexander in 323 BC, the kingdom experienced 25 years of turmoil as the generals, known as the Diadochi, engaged in power struggles and wars for control over the territory. In 301 BC, all of Alexandria's eligible relatives, including his wife, Roxana, and his young son, Alexander IV, had been killed, ending all family lineage to the throne. The four prominent generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy, divided the empire into four divisions and established their own ruling dynasties. Cassander ruled in the west, Lycomachus ruled in the north, including Asia Minor, Seleucus in the east, encompassing Syria and Babylon, and Ptolemy ruled in the south, including Egypt. Now, the two kingdoms that become more prominent as we read through the chapter is that of the Seleucus, the Seleucid kingdom, and the Ptolemic kingdom, the one ruling in Egypt. Now, just to make sure that these were definitely historical individuals, here are some carvings. You know, they were very much committed to keeping their name as long as possible, keeping their name going in history. So here are actual marble uh, statues of these various generals. Cassander, Lycomachus, who seems to be sort of the older of the group, Seleucus and Ptolemy. And the two in particular that's highlighted as you work your way through the prophecy is Seleucus, you'll see, who is in the northern area known as the King of the North, and Ptolemy, which is in the southern area, the southern area of Israel in Egypt, known as Ptolemy. So those are the two prime kingdoms that is brought to view at this point. All right, verse five. Also the king of the south shall become strong, as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. So now the prophecy is focusing in more specifically on the Seleucid kingdom and in the north and the Ptolemic kingdom in the south. Why those two kingdoms? Well, because in order to go from the kingdom in the north to the kingdom in the south, the only way to go back and forth between the two is through Palestine, through the land of Israel. And so the context of the prophecy of chapter 11 is dealing with what happens to the people of God, Israel, and the various kingdoms. And you'll notice as we read through the chapter, Israel goes back and forth. It's first under the control of the king of the south, which is Egypt, and then it goes back under the control of the king of the north, which is Syria, and it goes back and forth all the way until Rome, and you'll see how Rome comes into the picture and how the Jews make a covenant or an arrangement with Rome, and Rome becomes prominent, and the chapter will even bring you right up to the time of the birth of Jesus. It is an amazing chapter, a lot of historical details. You'll see it as we go through this. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the king of the south who will become strong. At this point in history, the king of the south was Ptolemy I, and those are the years there. One of his princes is Seleucus I, who in 316 BC was driven from Babylon by his rival Antigonus and was forced to place himself under the command of Ptolemy I, whom he assisted in defeating Demetrius, son of Antigonus, at Gaza in 312 BC. Shortly after this, Seleucus I succeeded in regaining his territories in Mesopotamia and later became even stronger than the Egyptian king Ptolemy I. When Seleucus died in 281 BC, his realm extended from modern-day Turkey to northern India, 
thus fulfilling the prophecy that his dominion shall be a great dominion. So we see the verse finding its fulfillment in the situation between the establishment of the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south. Now here is a long verse, so we're going to take it slow. There's a lot of details in this verse. This is verse 6. It says, and at the end of some years, that is about 35 years later in the story, you'll see in just a minute, at the end of some years, they shall join forces for the daughter of the king of the south, the king of the south at the time is Ptolemy II, for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north, which we're going to find out is Antiochus II in just a minute, to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of her authority. What's going to happen to her? She's not going to retain the power of authority. Why? Neither he, that is the king, nor his authority shall stand. But she shall be given up with those who brought her. Those will be the ones who came from Egypt with her. And with him who begat her. And with him who strengthened her in those times. Now, as I said, this is amazing. This was written hundreds of years before the events actually took place. And notice the detail that is given. Now, when you just read it, it doesn't seem to make sense. But if you read history at the time, you see how the pieces of the puzzle fit together perfectly. And here's the history. Look at the note. The prophecy next focuses on an event that occurred about 35 years after the death of Seleucus, king of the north. In an attempt to solidify peace after a long and costly war between the Seleucid, Seleucid Empire in the north and the Ptolemaic kingdom in the south, Antiochus II, grandson of Seleucus I, divorced his wife Laodice to marry Berenice, the daughter of the Egyptian king Ptolemy II, as part of a peace agreement. Now look back at the verse. It says, at the top of the verse, verse 6, and at the end of some years they shall join forces for the daughter of the king of the south, that's Berenice, shall go to the king of the north, that's Antiochus, or rather Seleucus, the, yeah, Antiochus II, grandson of Seleucus, but things won't go well. Take a look at what happened next. We're looking at the note. Shortly after the death of Ptolemy II, that is the king of the south, Antiochus II allowed his former wife, Laodice, whom he divorced to marry Berenice, sounds like a soap opera, I know, his former wife, Laodice, and her children to return to the royal court. He should not have done that. It did not take long for Laodice to take advantage of her new position. Shortly after being brought back to the palace, she had Antiochus II poisoned. Berenice, who was the Egyptian, had her and her infant son and all of her Egyptian attendants murdered. She also secured the throne of the Seleucid kingdom for her son, Seleucus Kalanik. Kalinicus, thus fulfilling the prophecy that Bernice shall not retain the power of her authority, and concerning Antiochus II, neither he nor his authority shall stand. Interesting, isn't it? Very detailed prophecy that we find its fulfillment in history. All right, verse 7, moving along. But the story doesn't end there. But from a branch of her roots, that is Berenice, but a branch from her roots, one shall arise in his place, who shall come with an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, and deal with them and prevail. So what is that referring to? Look at the history. Here's the note. Ptolemy III, the son of Ptolemy II, and the brother of Berenice, ascended to the throne of Egypt in 246 BC. Filled with a sense of duty to avenge the murder of his sister Berenice, Ptolemy III embarked on a military campaign into Syria, his military success against the Seleucid kingdom was not limited to Syria, but taking advantage of his military momentum, he conquered territories and extended, that extended into Mesopotamia and extended the, the uh, Ptolemaic power beyond its traditional boundaries. So the brother of Berenice takes revenge and he goes up to the king of the north and he has victory. Okay, Verse 8, and the story goes on. And he shall also carry away God's captive to Egypt with their princes and their, uh, their precious articles of silver and gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So this is talking about Berenice's brother, Ptolemy III, who avenged the death of his sister, marched up into the Seleucid kingdom. 
he gained a great victory, but then he gathered up a lot of the idols that had been taken from Egypt, and he brought them back down into Egypt. That's what's been referred to in the verse. Look at the note. After successfully avenging his sister's murder and expanding Egyptian influence into Syria and Mesopotamia, Ptolemy III, king of the south, turned his attention to restoring Egypt's wealth and cultural heritage. The sacred images and the artifacts that had been taken away from Egypt in previous conflicts were recovered and restored to their original temples, just like the Bible said it would. The victories gained over the Seleucid kingdom and the restoration of the temple idols garnered Ptolemy III great popularity amongst the people. Ptolemy III's death in 222 BC, two years after Seleucus III's death, fulfilled the prophecy that he should continue more years than the king of the north. Isn't that amazing? The accuracy of the prophecy and the details that have been fulfilled in history, it is amazing. Verse 9, the story goes on. Also the king of the north shall come into the kingdom of the king of the south, but he shall return to his own land. So the king of the south is Egypt, represented by the Ptolemaic dynasty. The king of the north is the Syrian area, Mesopotamia, the Seleucid kingdom. And so after Ptolemy III goes up and gains great victories in the north and brings back all of the idols that were confiscated from the Egyptian temples and he puts them back in the temples, well now the king of the north is going to take revenge once more against the king of the south. So that's what this verse is talking about. All right, it says the statement that the king of the north, looking at the note, shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south refers to a military campaign that involved Ptolemy III and Seleucus II. After Ptolemy III had successfully returned to Egypt with considerable wealth, Seleucus II sought to reassert his authority and marched against Egypt in 240 BC, aiming to recapture lost territory and restore his prestige. However, his military campaign resulted in a humiliating defeat, and Seleucus II was compelled to return to Syria without achieving any of his objections. Uh, objectives. That's why it says at the end of the verse, but he shall return to his own land. It was a failed military campaign, and that's what's brought to view. Whew, take a deep breath. You ready? It keeps going. More details. Verse 10. However, his sons shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces. When it says his sons, it's referring to the king of the north, all right, the Seleucid kingdom. His sons shall stir up strife and assemble a great multitude, a great force, and one shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through. Then he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife. So what historical event is highlighted? Look at the note. The two sons of Seleucus II were Seleucus III and Antiochus III, and they are their dates. The elder of these two was Seleucus III. He assembled a large army, but was poisoned by his generals before setting out on his military campaign against Egypt. After his death, however, his brother Antiochus III was crowned king, and in 219 BC, he initiated a systematic campaign to conquer Palestine from Ptolemy IV of Egypt. Antiochus III successfully took Palestine from Ptolemy IV and incorporated Jerusalem and its surrounding territories into his kingdom. Now, once again, let me just remind you the reason we have so much detail concerning the king of the north and the king of the south, why we're we not talking about other kingdoms at the time, well, because these two kingdoms were the ones that had an impact upon Jerusalem, upon the Jews, because they kept going back and forth and back and forth, and Jerusalem would be conquered by the Egyptians, and then it would be conquered by the Syrians, and it kind of go back and forth. So in this case, it's back in the hands of the Assyrians after Ptolemy had conquered Jerusalem, all right? So that's why it is mentioned here specifically. And then still continuing, verse 11, it says, And the king of the south, the king of the south shall be moved with rage and go out and fight with him, with the king of the north, who shall muster a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemy. So it's sort of back and forth between these two kingdoms, right? So Ptolemy IV of Egypt now marshaled a large army to check the progress of the Syrian king Antiochus III. According to the historian Polybius, the army of Antiochus III consisted of 62,000 footmen, 6,000 horses, and 102 elephants. Elephants were used in battle. 
The Egyptians had fewer footmen and horsemen and only 73 elephants. Yet, despite the numerical disadvantage of Ptolemy's army, Antiochus III was defeated at the Battle of Raphia in 217 BC, with nearly 14,000 soldiers slain and 4,000 taken prisoner. Thus, the army of Antiochus III was given into his hand of the king of the south, and Palestine once more changed hands. So I found it interesting here that it mentions this large army that was mustered and even the use of elephants. When you look back in history, I remember as a kid, I was once looking through some historical books and I saw a picture, it wasn't this picture, but it was a picture, I think, of the Persians battling Alexander the Great at the Battle of Arbalade, 331. And in the picture, it had these giant elephants that were sort of the tanks of the battle, you might say. And they came up and... Uh, they would be covered in armor, and they would have soldiers on their backs, and they were difficult to defeat. Nevertheless, the Egyptians were able to defeat the armies of the Syrians in this battle that's been described here. All right, verse 12, moving on. It says, And when he had taken away, and when he was taken away, the multitude, when he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up. And he will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. But Ptolemy IV of Egypt was so lifted up by his victories at Raphia and his recovery of Palestine that he held a grand victorious procession into the city of Jerusalem. He blasphemously offered sacrifices at the temple and even attempted to enter into the most holy place in spite of the protests and the entreaties of the Jews. Now, according to one historian when Ptolemy IV tried to enter into the temple and into the most holy place. You've got the courtyard, you've got the holy, you've got the most holy place. He wanted to go into the very most holy place to see what's inside. According to one historian, he became deathly sick and was carried out of the city by his men for wanting to go into the most holy place. He never actually made it into the most holy place, apparently, but he was carried out of the city. And as a result, he hated the Jews for this. And he actually ordered a slaughter of just a large number of Jews around Jerusalem in revenge for getting sick, for trying to go into the most holy place of the temple in Jerusalem. All right, still going on. In the meantime, during these years, 212 to 204 BC, Antiochus III, who is the king of the north, Ptolemy IV, the king of the south, turned his energies to recover his eastern territories and campaigned successfully as far as the borders of India. Ptolemy IV, death, king of Egypt, was concealed for some time. Then a son, aged four or five, succeeded him as Ptolemy V. So now we have what's called the boy king. Came to the throne in Egypt, and the king of the north, he thought, wow, here's an opportunity for me to now once again march against Egypt and take revenge. And so that's what happened. Verse 13, it says, for the king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and much equipment. And Iochus III felt that the child king, Ptolemy V, presented an excellent opportunity to take revenge on Egypt for his defeat at Raphia in 217. With an immense army, Antiochus III invaded southern Syria, seized Gaza, and occupied Palestine. He wanted to press south into Egypt itself, but Ptolemy V responded by dispatching his army under the leadership of his commander Scopus, who initially succeeded in recapturing southern Syria, Gaza, and Palestine, and drove the forces of Antiochus III back into the region of Lebanon. And that war took place in 202 to 201 BC. And I see a hand. Yes. Yes, Pastor. I'm just curious here. During these multiple generations when Israel is being passed back and forth between the two kingdoms, what's what is the Jewish relationship with God? They must be, God must have totally abandoned them during these several hundred years. A good question. You know, I think the Jews did go through a time of turmoil. Um, if you look at the history in the Old Testament of Israel, whenever they were faithful to God's commandments and didn't include idolatry as part of their worship, uh, they were blessed. God protected them. But whenever they followed the traditions and included the idolatry of the nations around them and they forsook the worship of the true God, then it seems that they went into the hands of these different powers, back and forth, back and forth. Now, after the Babylonian captivity, that for the most part prevented Israel from worshiping idols. 
However, there was so much internal conflict within Israel itself amongst the Jewish leadership. There was so much jealousy. There was a power struggle that was taking place. And you're going to find out a little later in our story, you have a group called the Maccabees, the Maccabee family, that also led a revolt against these oppressing kingdoms that came against them. So there was a lot of turmoil in Israel at the time. Yes, maybe they did think that Israel was abandoned. But the reason if they did feel that way was because they had abandoned God first. And that's what happened in the Old Testament, right? But nevertheless, God had a remnant. Remember in the story of Elijah, where Elijah felt so discouraged, he thought he was the only one during the time of Ahab and Jezebel, that he was the only one that was worshiping the true God. And God said, no, I have 7,000 in Israel that have not bowed their knee to Baal. So even at this time, amongst the Jews, there was a remnant, those who were studying the prophecies, those who were looking for the fulfillment of the time prophecies given by Jeremiah, Daniel, Isaiah. They were looking for that. And of course, we're leading up to the fulfillment of that when the Messiah was to come. Yes, question. Historically, you're looking at the king of the north and the king of the south here. How does that play in with the king of the north and the king of the south in Revelation? Spiritually, is there any connection here? Yes. The, in Revelation, we don't have a clear reference to the king of the south and the king of the north. That's just found here in Daniel chapter 11. But the powers represented by the king of the north and the king of the south, especially when we get later on. Revelation, for the most part, covers the history of the New Testament. We're still talking about history prior to Christ. So we're still in B.C. Revelation, for the most part, does 80. However, we're going to find out later in Revelation chapter 11, we're introduced to the papal power, and that clearly is referred to in the book of Revelation, and also referred to as Babylon in Revelation chapter 17. So there's a lot more details that we'll get in, but that's, that's the second half of this chapter when it gets into the, the role of the papacy. So first it talks about, we're not even at... Just to give you the context, we're still talking about Persia has already fallen. We're talking about the Greek, Grecian Empire. We're talking about the two divisions of Greece uh, going back and forth. And you're going to see a little later that Rome is suddenly introduced. And then you have Jesus. Then you have the persecution of the Christians. And then you have the establishment after the legalization of Christianity in 313 of the papal power. And then that continues all the way through to verse 40 in Revelation chapter 11. Verse 40 is a pivotal verse because it says, And at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at the king of the north. And then it brings us right up to our time. So there's still a lot of very important things that we have in store for our study here. Okay, well, talking about this, uh, let, let me read on here. Talking under verse 13. The king of the north will return, muster a multitude, and come up against the king of the south. Despite the initial success of the Egyptian forces under Scopus, Antiochus III launched another attack on the region and eventually met Scopus in battle near the mouth of the Jordan River at a place called Panium, later known as Caesarea Philippi. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. The battle was the turning point in the war as Antiochus III decisively defeated Scopus and the Egyptian armies and Egypt lost control over Palestine once and for all. The inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judea gladly welcomed the rule of Syria, which at first was mild and conciliatory but it did change. We have a reference to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is also mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. And I'm going to read the verse here, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. It says, When Jesus came to the regions of Caesarea Philippi, that's that area, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? Now, Caesarea Philippi was an area that was actually outside. It's on... If you think of Israel, and you've got the Sea of Galilee at the top and the Dead Sea at the bottom, the Sea of Galilee to the, north, uh, to the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee, up into the mountains, is where you find Caesarea Philippi. So Jesus, in the area of Galilee, took his disciples, and they went up outside of the area controlled by Israel to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was a famous place of worship of idols. There was a cave. I've actually been there a few years ago. Uh, amazing facts, and a few of our people went over there, and we, get, we got to go to Caesarea Philippi. There's a cave, and there was a spring in the cave, and water came out of the cave. And so uh, the Romans and even the Greeks began to create this as a place of worship for one of their deities. So Jesus brought his disciples to this area surrounded by pagans, and he asked them, who do people say that I am? Well, the disciples responded to him. Verse 14, Matthew chapter 16, verse 14, they said, some say that you are John the Baptist. Well, the reason they said John the Baptist is because, you know, John the Baptist was preaching and people were coming to him. 
Some said that he is Elijah, and the reason they said that was because of the prophecy that before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, God shall send Elijah the prophet. They said, well, this is Elijah come down from heaven. Other people said he's Jeremiah or just one of the prophets. Then he said to them, Jesus speaking, but who do you say that I am? In other words, Jesus says, I know what the people are saying about me, but who do you say I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, famous. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus said to Peter, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon by John, for flesh and blood is not revealed as to you, but my Father which is in heaven. In other words, for Peter to come to correct understanding of who Jesus was, it's more than just something that he heard from somebody else. It was not more than just an acknowledgement of historical fact. It was the moving of the Holy Spirit upon his heart. And here's the point I want to make. For us to come to a correct understanding of who Jesus is. I mean, we're talking about kingdoms, king of the north, king of the south, we're talking about wars, and we can see God's providence, we see his hand leading all of this, but despite all of what we see in the world today, in order for us to come to a point of peace in our own lives, as we are nearing the end of time, we need to know Jesus as the Christ, amen? We need to know him as our personal deliverer, our savior. The word Christ means the anointed one, the promised one, the one that would set Israel free from their enemies. Jesus is the Christ. So it was very profound that Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's why Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then, in closing here, he made this incredible statement. Jesus said, and also I say unto you, that you are Peter. Now the word Peter means a pebble or a stone in the original Greek. But on this rock, that would be the declaration that Peter just made, that Jesus is the Christ. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the church is not built upon Peter, as some would have you believe, but it's built upon the declaration made by Peter that Jesus is the Christ. After all, Peter himself never acknowledged to be the foundation of the church. He always spoke of Jesus being the cornerstone, him being the rock, him being the foundation. So here we find that in the last days, in the midst of conflict between nations and kingdoms, our only safety, our only hope is Jesus the rock, okay? I wanted to add that because that's important in the midst of this prophecy. I'm going to have to hold off on the questions because I want to just get to this next few verses before we run out of time. Verse 4, 14. Now in those times, many shall rise against the king of the south. The king of the south at the time was Ptolemy V. Also violent men of your people shall exalt themselves and fulfill the vision but they shall fall. Notice the phrase, violent people um, shall exalt themselves and fulfill the vision. We'll see that in just a minute. At this time, many Egyptians were rebelling against Ptolemy V, the boy king. The Rosetta Stone, I think you've heard about that, now in the British Museum, records certain concessions made by Ptolemy V to the Egyptian people in an effort to subdue civil unrest in the kingdom. In addition, Antiochus III secured an alliance with Philip of Macedon, the current successor to Cassander in the West. All these rose up against the king of the south. Here we have a picture of the Rosetta Stone. If you've gone to the British Museum, you have probably seen it. I have had a chance to go and see it. It's rather interesting. What's so special about the stone? You'll notice there are three types of writing that is on the stone. So a couple of things about it. What is it? It is a broken slab of black granite inscribed in two languages in three scripts. There's actually just two languages, even though it's got three different forms of writing. When was it inscribed? Around 196 BC, which is exactly the time when Ptolemy V, the child king, was king in Egypt. When was it found? In 1799. Remember, the end of the 2000, uh, 2,600 years of papal supremacy ended in 1798. Napoleon's forces, right after that in 1799, marched into Egypt, and one of his soldiers uncovered the Rosetta Stone. When was it actually deciphered? In 1822. And it was very interesting because, at first, they didn't understand the writing at the top is Egyptian hieroglyphics. It's all the little pictures. And most of the writings that they found in Egypt that was on the columns, on the walls, and the tombs was this type of writing, Egyptian hieroglyphics. They couldn't understand it. They couldn't read it. But when they found the Rosetta Stone, even at first they didn't fully understand it until later on in 1822, they discovered that the second uh, form of writing there is also Egyptian. But it's not Egyptian hieroglyphics, it's a cursive form of the Egyptian hieroglyphics. So it's just a different form. But then the key was the last uh, part there, and that was Greek. 
And of course, they could read the Greek alphabet, and they began to realize that it was the same on all three forms of writing. That was the key that unlocked the mystery of the Egyptian hieroglyphics. And so they were able to read and decipher. And the more they discovered from the Egyptian hieroglyphics, the more they realized the accuracy of the biblical account of the history that we find in the Bible. Up to that point, many people were questioning, can you really trust the history in the Bible? Well, suddenly they began to read these hieroglyphics. They began to realize, wait a minute, this does match up with what we find in the Bible. So it helped to validate the authority of Scripture. All right, well, that is probably a good place for us to stop. We'll pick up next week on verse 14. So keep your notes with you. Please bring the notes back next week, and we'll keep studying Revelation chapter 11. Oh, sorry, Revelation, Daniel chapter 11. And we've just begun. There is a lot of very interesting stuff yet to come. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we are grateful for your word, and even though there's a lot of detail, we can see your hand in pulling back the curtain of time and revealing many years in advance things that would take place in such fine detail and so accurate. Father, we can trust the Bible. We can trust the Word. And the prophecies that you have foretold that are yet to take place in the future in our day, we can also know for a certainty that they will take place because they were so faithfully fulfilled in the past. Thank you for your promise to be with us. And more than anything else, we want to make sure that Jesus is our Christ, that no matter what happens around us, we can have peace knowing that we are right with you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll continue with our worship service. God bless. Welcome to the Granite Bay Church.